All right, we're live and recording. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for the MindCore seminar series. My name is Heather Calvert. I'm the director of MindCore. Um, I want to just touch on two housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. We had a journal club yesterday, so there were some good questions that came out of that about um, some of Alex's work. So there are two ways that you can ask questions. If you have a sort of generic question that you think members of the audience can, could answer, you can just post it in the chat. You're encouraged to use the chat to clap, to um, ask for clarification questions. Um, if you know uh, a reference that she's mentioning and you want to paste a link to it, that's fine. Um, for serious questions, not that these other questions wouldn't be serious, I encourage you to use the ask a question feature um, that's just uh, along the bottom bar of our screens. And um, you should, if, even if you don't ask a question, you can look at the questions that have been asked and upvote them. And so then typically we get to the top questions um, at the end. And so that's the housekeeping. Please use the chat as much as you would like and please ask questions. And then I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Anna Papafragu, who's going to be the introduction of our speaker today. Thank you, Heather. I am uh, delighted to introduce uh, Alex Rosari to the MindCore speaker series. Alex is Assistant Professor of Psychology and Anthropology at the University of Michigan. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology from Harvard, spent two years at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, and then went on to get her PhD in evolutionary anthropology from Duke in 2012. Uh, Alex and her group examine the evolutionary origins of the human mind, a really deep fundamental question that is at the core of uh, the topic of the Mind Core speaker series um, this year. Uh, she studies how our primate relatives think about the world, whether their psychological abilities are similar to or different from our own, and why some species differ in their cognitive abilities. And to do this, she studies a variety of ape, monkey, and lemur populations in a lot of different locations in the US, Europe, and Africa. Um, Alex has done really interesting work on the evolution of capacities supporting decision making, executive control, and social cognition. And her work has implications for many disciplines that are interested in the social mind. And um, I was particularly interested in her work coming from the perspective of my own field, language acquisition and psycholinguistics, and thinking about uh, some of our uh, abilities to think about the minds of other people are rooted in um, ancient capabilities in our primate relatives. Uh, Alex has won many awards, including most recently an NSF Career Award and a Sloan Research Fellowship in Neuroscience. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Alex, who uh, is going to talk to us today about time, I believe, right? Yes, thank you, Anna, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, is the screen now visible to get started? Yeah, great. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a sense of time in human evolution. Uh, and to kick us off, I'm actually going to go back in time a little bit to this book by Wolfgang Kohler, published in 1921. Um, and Kohler was really a pioneering comparative psychologist, and he took the ideas of Darwin very seriously, and as a consequence thought that it would be important to look to our closest relatives to understand human mental processes. Um, I like this book for a couple of reasons. One is actually the subtitle that you might be able to see here, uh, which says, a report on the intellectual processes, the social behavior, and the individual characteristics of nine chimpanzees, with whom the author lived for six years and who exhibited a strange mixture of lack of understanding and genuine insight. And I, I've never actually heard a better description of what it's like to study chimpanzees than a, a strange mixture of a lack of understanding and genuine insight. So I, I really like that little subtitle. But you know, more importantly, this book really posited that one of the key differences between chimpanzees and humans, besides language actually, was that the time in which chimpanzees live is limited in past and future. So Kohler posited, that chimpanzees are basically stuck in time or stuck in the current moment. Um, and what I'm gonna try to do today is discuss whether it is the case that animals live in the now. Um, and if it is the case that they do or that they do so more so than us, what does that actually mean? Um, and I think this connects up to some broader issues in psychology about what self-control and patience is and what self-control and patience is for. Um, so on the one hand, there's a lot of ideas when people study animals that patience or self-control 
it's something like a domain general constraint that really serves to limit the complexity of their cognition and their behavior. So it might limit their ability to plan for the future or to engage in certain sort of, um, forms of social decision making that are future oriented. Um, but, a, but an alternative perspective coming from evolutionary biology and behavioral ecology is that we can think of patience and impulsivity as both sort of two sides of the same coin that serve as sort of a domain specific adaptation for foraging and other ecologically relevant behaviors. Uh, so in today's talk, I'm going to sort of discuss this idea that there's a way in which self-control serves as a constraint on some kinds of complex behavior and cognition and on humans, but also in that it serves as a sort of adaptation for foraging behaviors. Um, I think that non-human animals really do provide a lot of novel insights into human cognition. And just to sort of frame what I'm going to be talking about today, I think one crucial insight from non-humans that is that they can tell us something about this evolutionary function or the adaptive purpose of different cognitive traits. So today I'm gonna to be really thinking about what is the adaptive function of variation in self-control and patience. Uh, another way in which animals can help us address something about human cognition uh, is by looking to evolutionary dissociations across species. So by seeing if related skills are emerging together versus they actually are independent and can evolve separately, we can get a sense of what these cognitive constructs really are. Um, and then the final way in which animals, I think are really crucial for understanding humans is for getting at these big evolutionary transitions. So how do we bridge the gap between what humans are doing and the kinds of lives that humans are living um, and the kinds of lives that animals are living? Uh, so to do this work, uh, as Anna alluded to, my group studies a variety of primate species. So we have a strong focus on our two closest living relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, that are really important for getting that human unique cognitive features by comparing us to our closest living relatives. Uh, we also study more distantly related primate species like um, macaque species, as well as some even more distantly related primate species that might actually be unfamiliar to some, like these lemurs. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about lemurs later in the talk. Uh, to study these different animals, we mostly go to them. So our goal is to study animals in as close as to the wild as is possible. Uh, so this includes a lot of work in African ape sanctuaries as well as zoos. Um, so these African ape sanctuaries we work at are part of the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. These animals semi-free range in you know, tropical rainforest in Congo and Uganda where we work, but they also come into buildings at night to sleep and get food. So we're actually able to play uh, psychology games with them, much the way that a developmental psychologist might. We also partner with folks studying wild chimpanzees, and I'll talk a little bit about that later in the talk, uh, to try to bridge this gap between uh, cognition in the wild, what cognition is really being used to do. Uh, we study lemurs at the Duke Lemur Center, who also are able to free range for much of the year. Um, and we also do work with free ranging macaque species at the Kyle Santiago Field Station and Trentham Monkey Forest in the UK. So in today's talk, I'm gonna start out by thinking about this adaptive function of patients and contextualizing patients in uh, as a suite of abilities that I'm calling foraging cognition. Then I'm gonna transition from foraging to talking about cooking, which might seem like a little bit of a strange uh, transition, but I hope that to convince you that these are actually related. Uh, and then the end of the talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss how these abilities for patients might feed into other aspects of animal and, and human behavior, such as friendships and social relationships. Okay. So the big problem that I'm concerned with in my research is why does cognition evolve? Like what is causing more complex, flexible cognition to emerge in some species, but not necessarily in others? And there's really been two main flavors of an answer to this question. Um, one is I think pretty well known, which is that cognitive skills emerge to solve social problems. And um, this is sometimes called the social intelligence hypothesis or the social brain hypothesis. Uh, and this has emerged as you know, a really influential idea to explain, especially why some primate species might have complex uh, cognitive skills. But today I'm gonna focus on kind of a related but different explanation, which is that maybe some cognitive skills actually emerge to solve ecological problems or problems to do with finding food in the environment. Uh, and I have referred to the kinds of cognitive skills that might evolve in relationship to ecological complexity uh, as foraging cognition. And this might comprise some skills like 
uh, memory or navigation systems that allow animals to find food resources and navigate between them in the wild. Uh, a lot of aspects of decision making involving cost benefit trade offs to decide what kinds of food options are more valuable to pursue, um, as well as certainly aspects of cognitive control or executive function that allow individuals to adjust to a fluctuating world and deal with an environment that's not con consistent or stable. So I'm gonna be talking a little, and, and just to mention, this, this is not a complete list. This is sort of the key things that I think comprise foraging cognition, but actually some aspects of social decision making might also fall under this category uh, because a lot of social interactions actually have to do with uh, contest over food in wild animals. So I'm gonna be talking first about uh, this foraging cognition, the suite of skills in chimpanzees and bonobos. So chimpanzees and bonobos are our two closest living relatives. Uh, our lineage split off from theirs about five to seven million years ago, and they split from each other uh, less than a million years ago. So chimps and bonobos are really crucial for understanding human cognition and human behavior because they allow us to reconstruct the, the last common ancestor between ourselves and the other great apes, and then understand what's going on in this transition to, to, to modern humans. Um, but also I think chimpanzees and bonobos are really interesting intrinsically in and of themselves because they have some sort of neat differences in their wild socioecology that lets us test some ideas about what's the function of cognition. Um, in particular, uh, thinking about this ecological hypothesis for chimps and bonobos, compared to wild bonobos, uh, chimpanzees face longer travel times, so they um, have to deal with problems that impose uh, heavier temporal costs. Um, and they also engage in a lot of time-consuming tool use behavior, extractive foraging behavior that we just don't see in bonobos, which we've taken to mean that we would predict that chimpanzees have greater patience than bonobos. So a greater willingness to deal with time costs because they face these bigger um, time costs in the wild. Um, we also see that chimpanzees have more seasonally variable food resources in the wild, and they also hunt more, which is often construed as a, a, a risky or variable foraging strategy. Um, so we've predicted that actually chimpanzees will also be more risk prone or more willing to accept risks than our bonobos. Um, and finally, chimpanzees uh, depend less on what's termed ter ter terrestrial herbaceous foods, which you can kind of think of as like a big salad all over, all over the place. Um, it's a little bit easier to find, whereas chimpanzees focus more on fruits that are sort of distributed both in time and in space. Um, and chimpanzees also have a little bit bigger day ranges than bonobos, which means they have to deal with uh, recalling a larger uh, area of space. So based on this, we predicted also that chimpanzees would have more robust spatial memory skills than bonobos. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our, our work on patients as well as these other aspects of foraging cognition. So how do we measure patients in apes? Um, one of the common ways to study patients in animals is by uh, looking at intertemporal choice preferences. Um, by doing what's called uh, intertemporal titration. So the idea is that we bring apes um, into a room, they're first given a choice between two grapes and six grapes, and if you're a chimp or a bonobo, this is a very easy question, you definitely want six grapes. But the trick is that over time, we slowly adjust the delay that animals have to wait to get those six grapes. Um, so you know, if they show up on day one and they really like six grapes, on the second day, they're gonna to have to wait 10 seconds to get those six grapes. And then maybe on the third day, 20 seconds to get those six grapes. And we keep adjusting that delay to get the larger reward until their preferences for that smaller immediate reward is about equal to their preferences for that larger delayed reward. And so that's what I'm gonna be showing you is some data on this indifference point where they treat that larger reward as equivalent to that smaller reward. So this is what this looks like. Um, so this is a chimpanzee making a intertemporal choice. Um, he's quite familiar with this. Uh, he's done this several times. So what you're gonna see is that he's gonna flip this little plastic slider on the right side to choose the six grapes that are on the right side. The experimenter is gonna remove the alternative two grapes, and then you're gonna see him waiting for some period of time. And what I want you to do is pay attention to how long this feels um, to, to to wait this duration. So this chimp has done this several times. He's experienced this in um, initial exposure trials. So he knows how long it's gonna take to get those six grapes. Um, and he, here he is waiting for it.
Okay, so about 30 seconds has passed. Okay, about a minute has passed. If you're like me, you're getting really antsy and you're wondering when is this video ever going to end? Um, and in fact, we're only halfway done because this chimpanzee is choosing to wait two minutes to get those grapes. Um, and the key point here is that there's really a high opportunity cost for animals to wait in these kinds of contexts. Um, you know, it, it, is quite, it is quite boring to wait for these long periods of time. Um, for, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to skip ahead, but do know that this chimpanzee was, was waiting the full two minutes. Um, and here's some of the results about what, about what they, they did on average in this task. Um, so here we see uh, the performance of chimpanzees versus bonobos showing this indifference point. Um, and actually the chimpanzees waited about two minutes on average before they found uh, this, this waiting to be not worth it. So after about two minutes, they sort of gave up and said, I'm gonna choose those two grapes now. But up until a delay of about two minutes, chimpanzees were willing to wait um, just to get that extra four grapes. Bonobos were also willing to wait, but in line with our predictions, they were actually significantly less uh, willing to wait than chimpanzees. So they were willing to wait on average about 74 seconds. Um, so this is in line with this ecological hypothesis that chimps are more willing to tolerate uh, long time delays in, in their decisions. Um, I do want to mention, though, that both of these species are waiting quite a long period compared to other animals tested in a comparable situation. So here's some data from tamarins and marmosets, two species of New World monkeys. Um, and you can see that compared to the apes, both of them are, are, are really not willing to wait very much at all. So the marmosets are waiting about 14 seconds and the tamarins about eight seconds. Um, so even though chimps are waiting longer than bonobos, both of them are actually waiting quite a long period of time compared to other animals in this context. We've done other work with apes to replicate this basic result where we kind of did more of a quick and dirty comparison of how often they choose this larger delayed reward where we just set the delay at either one minute or two minutes. Um, and we find that it, chimps and bonobos, you know, they adjust their choices appropriately so they're more willing to wait um, for the shorter delay than the longer delay, but overall the chimps are again more likely to choose um, to wait for that larger delayed reward compared to bonobos, even when we test them in a different kind of setup and test different populations of apes. I mean, this aligns with sort of a, a general pattern of results we found, which is that uh, chimps and bonobos seem to have these selective differences in how they uh, deal with foraging problems. So chimpanzees are more patient than bonobos across several different contexts. Uh, they're more willing to gamble on uh, variable outcomes than bonobos, tested in different ways. Uh, and they also have more accurate spatial memory than bonobos um, when tested in a variety of different ways, emulating different components of foraging. So this aligns with this view that there, there is sort of ecological differences that we can see in their cognition. So there's an ecological signature in their cognitive abilities reflecting their wild um, environment. I want to emphasize that these differences really do seem targeted. So it's not that chimps and bonobos show differences across the board and like solve all sorts of problems differently. Um, actually, in a variety of, of basic cognitive abilities like uh, number discrimination, uh, object permanence, all sorts of things, chimps and bonobos look quite similar. Um, even in some aspects of their decision making, they don't have this sort of ecological relevance. They look quite similar, but they have these targeted differences in aspects of their cognition that seem to map on to their wild socioecology. Um, another way we can get at this idea that patience really is a foraging uh, adaptation in, in apes is to look at its relationship to social abilities. So one way we've tried to do this is by looking at variation in delay of gratification in the chimps and try to see how this maps on to other kinds of cognitive skills. So in this particular study, um, we, we studied 40 chimps and we found quite a lot of variation in their willingness to wait. So individuals varied uh, in their choices for waiting for the larger delayed reward between 36 to 100% of the time. But even though we found this variation in their patients, we found that this variation in patients did not predict um, their willingness to donate food to another individual. It did not predict their um, willingness to engage in instrumental helping. 
and did not predict their willingness to punish others. Uh, so we adapted a variety of cooperative tasks from other work to look at the interrelationships here. And in fact, neither delay of gratification nor actually motor inhibitory control predicted these different aspects of cooperative abilities. Um, again, suggesting that there's some kind of difference here between patients and social cognition and social behavior. A third way we've tried to test this idea um, is actually by moving away from apes to studying lemurs. Um, and lemurs are the most distantly related primates to humans, but they're kind of a fascinating evolutionary experiment because lemurs radiated on the island of Madagascar to fill a lot of social and ecological niches that primates don't normally fill in other parts of the world. So we've been especially focused on these four species of lemurs, um, rough lemurs, mongoose lemurs, ringtail lemurs, and cockleshell fox. And the reason is because these four species have independent variation in both their ecological complexity as well as their social complexity. So on the one hand, if we look at rough lemurs and cockerel fox, we see that rough lemurs are extremely frugivorous. They, their diets often compose more than 90% fruit. Um, so that's sort of a more complicated kind of food source to feed on. Where shafox are actually obligatory folivores, so they only eat leaves, and that's normally considered to be a fairly uh, cognitively easy strategy for a primate. Um, but they have very similar social group structures and social complexity. So we see this clear contrast on their ecological variation, but not in social variation. Um, in contrast, we can look at the mongoose lemurs and the ringtail lemurs, and they have a pretty similar diet, but they have a big difference in their social complexity with the ringtail lemurs living in large complex groups with dominance hierarchies, and the mongoose lemurs living in small pair bonded groups. Um, so this allows us to directly contrast uh, both the social hypothesis for intelligence and the ecological hypothesis within the same data set. Uh, and one thing we've been doing with this is looking at actually uh, executive control or cognitive control, because this is really thought to be a set of cognitive processes that are crucial for enabling intelligence. So cognitive processes that support purposeful goal-directed behaviors. Um, and in these lemurs, we've looked at delay of gratification, motor inhibitory control, um, short-term memory, reversal learning and responses to novelty. So we had lemurs from all these four species doing a big battery of tasks. Um, and we found pretty consistent evidence that really ecology seems to be the primary predictor of performance across these tasks. So especially the rough lemurs compared to the shafox show big differences where the rough lemurs tend to outperform the other species um, and the shafox tend to be doing worse than the other species. So this is work led by my postdoc, Francesca Di Petrillo, um, who's been trying to map these different aspects of cognition in these, in these little lemurs. Um, zooming out even more um, to think about foraging co cognition in this larger evolutionary context, work by other groups has shown that uh, intertemporal preferences are predicted better by uh, ecological variables like home range size, but are actually not predicted by group size or social complexity across 13 primate species. Um, and that ecology is measured by dietary breadth predicts in motor inhibitory control across 23 primate species, whereas group size as a measure of social complexity does not. So taking all this evidence together sort of supports this idea that patience is really an adaptation for foraging and both uh, long tolerance of delays, but also impulsivity can both be adaptive strategies depending on the kinds of environments that different animals are living in. Okay, so now I'm gonna to transition to talk a little bit about cooking. Um, and this might seem a little bit random, but I think it actually follows really directly from my interest in foraging cognition, because cooking is really a crucial part of human foraging cognition. So in thinking more generally about, uh, about humans and the human ecological niche, I'm just gonna emphasize that a lot of these ecological features I've been talking about in other primates are actually greatly exacerbated in, in humans living in small scale societies like uh, hunter gatherers. So here's some um, data adapted, like looking sort of broadly at the differences we've seen between human foragers and chimpanzees and bonobos. And some key points are um, that human foragers have really large day ranges compared to chimps and bonobos. Um, so human foragers are traveling long distances as well as engaging in a pattern of central place foraging that poses new sort of ecological problems. Um, and you know, I would suggest that this could be a, a big reason why humans might have 
um, very elaborated skills for dealing with patients and for memory in order to navigate these large spaces. Uh, human foragers also face a lot of variance in return, um, so a lot of risk, and a lot of the ideas for why people might be engaging in high rates of food sharing and other forms of cooperative behaviors actually is a strategy to mitigate that risk. Um, and then finally, across human societies, uh, people eat cooked foods. Um, and you know, one of the big uh, questions for me is, what kind of skills do you need to be able to cook foods, to see this, um, this shift in the niche that humans are living in compared to other primates? Um, and a theory by Richard Wrangham has proposed that actually the shift to a cooked diet was one of the crucial transitions in human evolution. Um, so the logic here is that cooking really increases the energy available from food. Uh, it also increases is the pal palatability of the food, but it increases the energy we can extract from it. Um, humans seem to really depend on cooking. So um, uh, Richard Wrangham has synthesized a lot of evidence that when people eat a purely raw diet, like a chimpanzee diet, um, you actually don't do very well on this kind of diet. So it seems like we need to eat cooked food. Um, and his proposal is actually that cooking solves the expensive tissue problem, which means that the shift to a cooked diet is actually the explanation for why humans were able to grow such a large brain. Um, it provides this energy. So this theory posits that actually cooking emerged very early in human evolution. Um, and we thought that one way to test this would be actually look at our closest relatives to see if they can solve problems that kind of emulate cooking and get a sense of how likely it was that these um, hominins, these earlier hominins were able to do the same thing. So of course, no, you know, there's no list of like, what are the cognitive skills you need to cook food? So um, myself and collaborator Felix Barnikin tried to come up with what are the things you need to do to be able to cook food. And we thought, well, okay, first, um, you need to like cooked food. Uh, you, you have to have a motivation to cook food. Um, cooking intrinsically poses a temporal problem because cooking takes time. So you might need some of these same skills for patients that we think uh, have something to do with foraging, but you might need to apply that to a cooking problem. Uh, you need to have some kind of inhibitory control because you're going to have raw food in your hand and you're going to have to give it up in order to acquire cooked food. It might help to have some very basic understanding of causality, right? Because if you're going to put raw food on a fire, it, you might want to know that it's going to turn it into cooked food. Um, and of course, you know, zooming out, you might really want to be able to plan for this because oftentimes you've collected raw food, but you can't cook it right then and there. So you have to kind of plan for the future. So our approach was to try to break down the process of cooking into these different cognitive components and test for these skills in chimpanzees. Um, so the first thing we did was ask the question, do chimpanzees prefer cooked food? Um, and we found, yes, indeed. Replicating prior work, chimps have a strong preference for even minimally cooked food, like a cooked potato. Um, then we looked at whether chimps show patience for cooked food. So we used the same basic kind of temporal discounting task I've already discussed, and we compared a situation where that delayed food was either raw versus cooked. Um, and we found that indeed chimps are willing to wait for a larger raw, raw food reward, but they're even more willing to wait for a larger delayed food reward, suggesting that they do have some patience to wait around for getting cooked food. Then we wanted to kind of emulate the process of cooking. So how do, how do we give chimpanzees a novel problem that's kind of like cooking and can get at some of these other aspects of their cognitive understanding? So to do that, we uh, created what we call the cooking device, the magical cooking device, which is basically like a, um, very, uh, a very simple chimpanzee microwave. So the idea is that if you take a raw piece of food and you put it in this cooking device and then a human experimenter shakes the cooking device, it seems like magically a, a cooked piece of food comes out. So this is really a sleight of hand, but it sort of creates this sort of causal sequence where chimps can give up raw food in their hand in order to have food be cooked. Um, and we could contrast that also with a, with a control device to check maybe chimps just really like putting food in containers or they find it really hilarious to watch a human shake a bowl. So we can manipulate this other device in the same way and see whether or not they specifically are putting their food in this cooking device. Um, so here's an example of when we first gave a chimp this kind of choice. Um, so what you'll see here is an experimenter holding out the cooking device and the control device. Um, the chimpanzee is then given a piece of raw food by another experimenter, and you'll see what happens.
Okay, so the chimpanzee ate the food, and that was actually what we thought was going to happen because, you know, giving up food in your hand is really a challenging problem for a lot of primates. And we kind of expected that this problem would be so severe that they would not be able to give up this food in order to have it be cooked. Um, but actually, we then saw that sometimes chimpanzees instead did this. So sometimes these chimpanzees would take the food that they were given and actually place it in this cooking device in order to have it be cooked. Um, and in our first study where we looked at 21 chimps, we found that actually 13 of these 21 chimps pretty spontaneously made this inference and put their food in this cooking device. And they almost never put the food in the control device, indicating that they really had a preference for it to be cooked. It was not just putting food in, in random containers or having people shake food. So we found this result that they do actually put their food in this cooking device. We actually replicated again to confirm this. We then went on to show that they um, seem to treat this really like a, a cooking device and that they selectively put in raw food, but they did not put in already cooked food or inedible items um, to get it this sort of understanding of causality. Um, we showed that they actually can transport this food in order to cook it. So they're able to transport it short distances in order to, have, to put it in this cooking device. Um, and then finally, we looked at whether or not they could actually save food, collect food in order to cook it in the future. And the key thing here is this is not something chimpanzees naturally do in their wild behavior. Um, chimpanzees don't really save or accumulate food. To test this, we would give chimpanzees um, a set of raw pieces of food. And then basically every three minutes, someone would show up with uh, the cooking device and the control device. And if the chimps had saved any of their food, then they could place it in this device. So we contrasted a test session where this cooking device was becoming available every so often with a control session where there were no opportunities to cook. So we could confirm that they would actually eat all this food when they couldn't do anything else with it. And both of these sessions, they just got 10 trials to see if they could sort of anticipate this future opportunity to cook. So here's our results. Um, so this is showing the data from the control condition. So we looked at how much food was put in the cooking device, how much food was put in the control device, and how much was just left like on the floor of the room. And in the control condition, you can see that on average, they left about one of the 30 slices they got in the session in the room. But in the anticipation condition, they actually would save several pieces of food in order to put them in this cooking device. Uh, so, you know, this was a hard problem for them. Um, uh, many chimps were not able to save food, but some of them were capable of saving food, um, showing that at least some chimps are able to kind of anticipate future opportunities to cook and save their food for the future. Um, so going back to this idea of like the, the roots of novel human behaviors, you know, to our surprise, we actually found evidence that chimps can do the basic versions of, of all these things. So they have a motivation to cook, they have some patience for cooking, they can inhibit their immediate reactions to do so. They understand something about the causality of the transformation and they can maybe even plan a little bit for future cooking opportunities. Um, so, you know, I think that this shows how chimpanzees can apply a set of skills that were really designed for foraging, but they can apply them to solve this novel problem, um, which can give us an idea of how to, how to bridge that gap, how to make that transition between uh, an animal mode of being and this new human um, behavioral feature. Uh, you know, my inference is that early hominins could likely do the same, um, and maybe they could use opportunistic bushfires uh, to cook food. Um, and this might actually bootstrap more active control of fire, because of course, chimpanzees do not actively control fire the way human populations do. Um, and given that chimps were pretty successful at all of this, I think another possibility is that a big difference between humans and chimpanzees in terms of this transition is not actually about cognition for cooking, it's about the social tolerance you need in order to cook food. Um, because cooking is normally a social problem or a social behavior in humans. Um, we show that chimps can do these things when they're kind of on their own. Uh, but I think there's actually a big possibility that a lot of this would fall apart if they were in a social context where others could potentially steal the food that they were trying to cook. Um, and that then they would be less willing to do any of these, um, these novel behaviors. 
So that brings me to the last bit of my talk, um, where I'm going to transition from thinking about forging patients in the context of forging cognition to patients in the context of, of social of social behaviors. Um, so thinking about how social tolerance and friendships might actually be tied into some of these concepts about future-oriented cognition. Um, and to do so, I'm going to draw a little bit from uh, a, a theory called socio-emotional selectivity theory um, from social psychology. And I think this is a really interesting theory to think about from an evolutionary or comparative perspective. Um, it's a lifespan theory aimed at trying to explain why people shift their social behaviors as they age. Um, and the idea is that when individuals are younger, younger adults will actually be aimed more at seeking out new information and building new relationships. Um, but that as individuals old, uh, age and get older, um, there's an increasing focus on positive, high value, or emotionally fulfilling relationships. So there's this transition from knowledge needs to emotion needs um, in, in human social behavior. So the key thing that I think is really interesting from a comparative perspective is that this theory posits that this transition happens because of our own human specific awareness of personal future time horizon. So the idea is that when people perceive the future as being very long and expansive, we're more in this um, building new relationship mode. But as we perceive that time is running out, the idea is you just don't have time for, for dealing with that anymore. You're kind of going to focus in on these emotionally fulfilling, important relationships. Um, and this makes, you know, this theory wasn't set up to, to, to test anything about animals, but I think because it's such a clear idea, it actually creates some really nice predictions about what we should see in animals. And in particular, since we don't think animals, you know, have this rich sense of themselves decades down the line or understand that later they're going to die, that they really should not show this transition in their social behavior if that transition depends on this subjective awareness of future time horizons. Um, so, you know, this ties in with a new emerging line of my research, which is looking at the origins of human-like cognition in, in a slightly different way than what I've been talking about. So in the talk today, I've been focusing on thinking about the evolutionary roots of non-human, of human cognition by looking at non-human animals. Uh, but another way to get at this question uh, is through developmental studies of changes in cognition in humans. What I've been trying to do is actually integrate both of these approaches to look at comparative cognitive development in aging. So by testing larger samples of animals um, that vary in age from infancy into old age, we can start to disentangle how ontogenetic processes are actually feeding into the unique human characteristics that we see. Um, so I was going to use this approach, this comparative cognitive development and aging approach, to try to understand uh, changes as in, changes in social behavior in humans compared to other animals. So you know, one of the first uh, ways I tried to get at that was by looking at socio-emotional biases, actually, in macaque monkeys. So these are rhesus monkeys living at the Cayo Santiago Field Station. Um, you know, this, this location is really unique for research because it's a population of more than a thousand monkeys um, that are living a very naturalistic life, which means it's actually possible to test hundreds of monkeys ranging in age from very young to very old. Um, so to get at socio-emotional selectivity theory, we wanted to see, do monkeys show this shift to having a greater focus on positive socio-emotional signals? This is the kind of shift we see in humans. Do we see the same thing in these monkeys? Um, to do that, we looked at whether they um, paid attention to threat signals, so conspecific threat photos, compared to a neutral matched photo, um, as well as whether they would pay more or less attention to an, a positive or affiliative photo, like this lip smacking photo, compared to a, a neutral matched photo of the same individual. So we were interested in when the monkeys get older, are they paying more attention to this positive expression relative to neutral and somewhat less attention to this negative expression compared to neutral? Um, and actually what we found was that as monkeys get older, well, as monkeys get older, they don't really wanna look as much to photos at all. So they kind of have overall looking declines. Um, but you can see that there's actually a real shift that these older monkeys are especially attentive to this threat photo. Um, so the decline in looking is actually driven by lack of interest in that neutral photo, photo. And there's a real switch to looking much more at that threat photo. 
Um, in contrast, when you look across the lifespan in responses to these positive expressions, um, there's really no change in how monkeys uh, pay attention to this positive expression compared to neutral expression, um, which suggests that actually the macaques are having a negativity bias with age. So like sort of the opposite of what we see in humans, that there's increasing focus on this negative um, socio-emotional information. Um, zooming out, myself and collaborator Zareen Machanda, uh, who's based at Tufts, actually tried to get at this question by, by consolidating a lot of information about uh, the relative balance of behavior, of social behaviors across species. So we were able to get uh, information from other people's studies, like across a whole bunch of different primate species, um, including apes, old world monkeys, and new world monkeys, and lemurs. So looking at all these different species, we consolidated sort of their social aging phenotype. So this comprised mostly um, behavioral studies, but also some cognitive experiments like the one I just talked about. I and mean, when we looked at changes during aging and how engaged the different species are um, with other social individuals, the valence of these interactions. So do they tend to be more positive as indexed by grooming or more negative as indexed by aggression, um, as well as um, changes in social influence with aging. So I'm just going to focus in here on what we saw with valence, so this sort of response to emotional emotional content. And we found that across a wide variety of species, um, it's pretty consistent that animals show consistent engagement in aggression or negative behaviors, but actually declines during aging in affiliative or positive behaviors, suggesting that um, this cognitive result we found in the rhesus monkeys might extend more broadly to a, a, a large scale behavioral negativity bias during aging in lots of primates. But of course, you know, a lot of these primates are more distantly related to humans. Um, and humans are also very special in that we have a very, very long lifespan. Um, and we have a lot of social choice compared to other primate species in terms of who we can interact with and, and when we choose to do so. So we were additionally interested in looking at not just primates in general, but also specifically chimpanzees. Um, because chimpanzees share these features with humans of a, of a fairly long lifespan. So chimps can live up to 50 or 60 years in the wild. Um, and they also have a very high degree of social choice in terms of who they spend time with because they live in fission fusion societies where chimps um, can break up into smaller parties and then come back together in larger groups. Um, so this is work in collaboration with Sari Machanda as well as the whole Kibali Chimpanzee Project, um, which has been studying chimpanzees in Uganda for more than 30 years. So we took longitudinal data from wild chimpanzees ranging in age from 15 when they just sort of entered the adult hierarchy to the oldest chimp in our sample was 58 years. Um, we looked at focal observations with detailed records of everything they were doing in terms of their social, uh, social behavior. This included about 78,000 hours of observation time. Um, these chimps in the data set were on average looked at for more than 10 years, and about half of each year there was an observation uh, day for each individual. And by looking at changes in these chimpanzees' behavior with time, we found that in contrast to all these other primate species, chimps really seem to show a positivity bias with age. Um, so grooming, this positive affiliative behavior, stays pretty steady as chimpanzees age. But rates of aggression, including both directed aggression with a target, as well as non-directed aggression, which is like aggressive displays, both of these kinds of aggression really decline during aging in chimpanzees. Um, and then we were really interested in expanding this to look at uh, also the patterns and the tenor of their social relationships, because actually older adult humans um, have fewer but more high quality relationships. So older adults focus more on these really important social relationships. And again, the idea is that this is because of our sense of time, our sense of our own impending mortality. So we looked at these chimps who we don't think have the same rich sense of time. And we tried to categorize their relationships into one-sided friendships, where these are relationships where the chimps um, sort of social advances are not reciprocated by the target. And mutual friendships where both individuals had a strong preference for the other. And we found that these one-sided friendships actually really decline with age. So this is showing um, how often young adults are one-sided friends with either other young adults, prime age adults, or older adults. Um, and what you can see is that these young adults um, really have a lot of one-sided friendships that are primarily directed at individuals that are older than them, like the prime age and older adults. 
So there's this um, decline in one-sided friendships with age, but actually there's a striking increase in mutual friendships with age. So these older adults have more mutual friendships and they're specifically mutual friends with each other. Um, so two older adults have this very strong bond. Um, and we also showed that these bonds, these mutual friendship bonds um, involve a high rate of investment in the relationship through grooming, as well as a very equitable rate of investment via equitable rates of grooming. Um, so, you know, this shows that although um, chimpanzees don't have this rich future sense of time, they do show this pattern of social selectivity that we see in humans, um, suggesting that this, this could be a constraint on some animals, but at least in some cases, uh, this more narrow sense of time doesn't seem to preclude these social changes that we see during aging. Um, we think that this might actually also show that these social changes are really adaptive um, and that they emerge in species with these long, slow life histories where social bonds are really important. So go back to the beginning of the talk. Um, you know, I set up the talk by uh, saying I was going to talk about whether animals live in the now and what does it mean if they do, um, with reference to this idea that, you know, patience and self-control in some ways serves as a constraint on the expression of other complex behaviors, but in other ways could be an adaptive solution to the kinds of problems that different animal species face in the wild. So what I've shown um, is that on the first case that patients actually can differ adaptively across species. So we see variation in patients as well as other aspects of foraging cognition seems to be related to wild ecology across a lot of primate species. Um, I've also shown this last evidence that life history might be really important for understanding the role of patients in other complex forms of behavior. So by looking to, at lifespan changes in cognition and behavior in other animals, we can start to understand how this is playing out over human development as well. And then finally, you know, I think one key point here is that apes really do reveal the roots of human cognition. Um, our close relatives show this pattern of both shared but also divergent cognition and behavior with other with humans and this allows us to disentangle what's going on in our own species. So I want to thank um, all of my collaborators, uh, especially all of the research sites where none of this would be possible without their support um, and finally the funding sources for all of this work. Thank you. Thank you Alex for a fascinating talk. Um, the questions have already started uh, coming in. If you have a question, please enter it in the question box. And uh, I'm going to read out the first couple of questions. We have a question from Joe Cable um, who, that goes back to some of the um, uh, uh, relevance for some of the, uh, you know, uh, let me read it out. <laughs> the question is, how do you think about individual differences in patients from the lens of its relevance for foraging cognition? Do you think these differences evolved because there are different niches that can be filled even within one species? Or do these differences arise from other sources or for other reasons? Um, and or maybe depend on um, early foraging experience or the environment. That yeah, experience. I think that's a really great question. And, you know, I hope that actually this is something we're going to start to be able to tackle in our work because one of the challenges of work with non human cognition is really that the sample sizes are often not big enough to get at this question. Um, so I think some of, some of what, some of the answer to that is probably there are adaptations that, that play out in, in terms of individual differences for things like sex differences, right? So actually, um, in chimpanzees, for example, males and females actually will sometimes forage in slightly different ways. So we see that female chimps, um, for example, tend to be more skillful tool users or more um, engaged in tool use behavior than males. So you might predict then that there's individual variation in their patients that maps onto that. Now, interestingly, we've never actually found such individual variation. So we have looked for it, but we've never found it to date. But that would be one potential sort of adaptive source. Um, I think that the developmental changes might be another sort of source of individual variation that could map onto adaptive differences at different points of the life stage. And then I think your final comment was, you know, this have to do with learning and experience over the lifespan. And I, and I think that probably is really important for species like chimps and bonobos that we know are very um, behaviorally flexible. So at different sites across the wild, you know, these animals are doing different things, especially chimpanzees. So 
you know, whatever adaptations they have for foraging, it also has to have a lot of um, sensitivity to the local environmental context because chimps can be living in, in quite variable environments. Some are living in, you know, the rainforest, other are living in something more like the savanna. Um, and if they just had a really fixed strategy that came out regardless of this local context, that would probably not be um, a really good strategy. So some kind of um, environmental sensitivity that allows animals to tailor their strategies to the local context seems really important. Thank you. Um, we have a second question from B2. Um, the question is, how plastic are these interspecies differences in patients with respect to training ex regimes in the lab? I would imagine a plastic circuit would be advantageous relative to a more rigid circuit, especially if there's a high probability of environmental Yeah, change. I think this is also a really important question. And, you know, one thing we've been really concerned about is whether the species differences hold up if we look at different populations of animals um, who've had different kinds of marine experiences or um, really depend on the particular tasks we're using. So in the case of patients, we've, we've seen this difference between chimps and bonobos, um, both in the Leipzig Zoo and in the African sanctuaries using different techniques. So that gives us you know, some measure of confidence that this, at least the relative difference holds up. Um, but I think one thing we haven't really specifically looked at is whether um, the performance in particular tasks depends a lot on the kinds of experiences animals have had in these different contexts. Um, so, you know, one thing I would point out is that by studying animals in these captive contexts, we can kind of equate some of the environmental experiences they're having, and that's different from in the wild. So, you know, in the wild, a wild chimp and a wild bonobo would grow up having different kinds of foraging experiences. Um, that might be shaping their responses to decisions about time. But in a zoo or in a sanctuary, actually these two species are having very similar kinds of experiences because there's normally very similar sort of, um, you know, they're all being provisioned, for example. They're not doing most of their foraging through natural means. Uh, so we can kind of equate this. It's, it's similar with the lemur center, right? So these species in the wild live in very different environments, but at the lemur center, they're all right there in the same location getting the same kind of um, experiences, basically. So I think that that's sort of one important advantage of doing studies with animals where the environments have been equated to try to get at that question. Thank you. Uh, Dan Romer asks, um, why do you think risk-taking is greater for animals that have more patients? Sorry, was it why is risk-taking greater for animals that have more patients? Yeah. You know, yes. I think that's a mm -hmm. that's a really interesting question because it, it speaks to sort of, there's some tension here between how people think about individual differences and in impulsivity within a species and how sometimes evolutionary biologists think about the variation between species because we see that these more patient chimps, so like the less impulsive phenotype are also more risk-taking, the more impulsive risk phenotype. Um, but in humans, you often see that like, temporal impulsivity goes with risk-taking, somehow goes together. So, you know, a lot of the ideas about this are that in the wild, um, the delayed rewards have some, some level of intrinsic risk. So that probably doesn't account for everything that animals are doing. But the idea is that, you know, in nature, something that's delayed always presents some modicum of risk. So you might actually expect, if you're willing to take uh, if you're willing to be patient, you're also somehow intrinsically willing to take the risk that this reward you're waiting for will never materialize. So in the lab, uh, you know, we can control that. We can ensure that this is not the case, that these, these delayed rewards do come to the animal, but that doesn't mean the animal is set up to think about the problem that way. So they, they might still be kind of have that um, risk sensitivity built in when they're doing decisions about time. Uh, next question comes from uh, Marcelina Martinek. Um, with the cooking experiments, has there been any conditions with a potato being charred or overcooked? How do you think the chimps will handle this form of consequence? Yeah, so the, the sort of failed cooking. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, we've never done that. Our, our, I think we've never done that because, you know, our primary aim originally was to actually cook the potato as minimally as possible so that the amount of time, you know, these were all pre-cooked potatoes and we basically cooked them about a, for about a minute so that it kind of matched the amount of cooking 
the cooking time matched the delays we really used in the study um, under the idea that we wanted to just get at these like the shortest delay possible that would provide some benefit to cooking. Um, I, I have the sense that they might still really like the charred potato because they don't really love the raw potato. Um, this is something they used to be fed a lot, so they were familiar with it, but I think they had a strong preference for these cooked potatoes. I'll say that I've tasted the potatoes we used and I did not like them very much in either the raw or the cooked form. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, you know, I think that sort of speaks to a really subtle uh, understanding, like do they understand that it could go too long? Um, and that would, that would be really cool to, if they could do that, that would be really neat to me. And by the way, we all need one of these magical cooking devices. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just shake the device and it cooks the potato. <laughs> yes. You could patent those, that would be great. Um, another cooking question, Noga Vardi asks, can you give the cooking device to the chimpanzee? Will it learn how to use it? Yeah, I mean, we thought a lot about how to do that. Uh, we actually originally had this idea that we would really cook in front of them. And we brought like mm -hmm. a camping cooker and all this crazy stuff to Africa to try to, to try to cook in front of them. But then we thought, oh, well, you know, this is dangerous. And actually they see sometimes people cooking with fire in the vicinity of the sanctuary. So we wanted to have this novel thing. Um, but yeah, we kind of, the thing we built was not something that's chimp friendly in the sense that you could hand it to them and it would work, right? Mm -hmm. It really requires this human operating it. Um, but I think it would be really cool if we could, if we could uh, have more advanced technological skills on the human side for us to build like a real chimpanzee microwave that they could operate without the person being present. Mm -hmm. I think that would be um, a, a way to get at that question. Like, can they, can they do it sort of on their own time? And explore causal causal inferences this way, right? Yeah, I think I always yeah. thought it would be neat. Could we set up something like, you know, like a like these conveyor belts, like where bagels are going on, so they can just mm -hmm. put their their cooked potato, and it kind of goes through and gets cooked. But we we the human experimenters were not technologically advanced enough to carry out this this particular manipulation. Right. <laughs> um. We have another question about patience from uh, Rob Haas. So the question is, in the video clip of the chimp waiting for the six grapes, uh, it looked like he was sitting down, pacing, trying to distract himself, not just sitting by the opening, waiting. Have you noticed differences in what animals do while they wait, and if that correlates with their patience? So um, work by other folks, uh, like Michael Barron, has tested that and actually found that there's some really neat uh, results that chimps will self-destruct to some extent. So, um, mm. so chimps will do some of these strategies that we see that like human children will do um, to allow them to wait longer. So Maybe my you should give them an iPhone, not a cooking device. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean like, you know, and I, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting question, like can they come up with these strategies on their own or if they're there, can they take advantage of them? Mm -hmm. So we've never specifically looked at that. Um, so they're just kind of in the room. But, uh, but one thing we have looked at in some detail is their emotional reactions to the outcomes. Um, so we we see that they actually have, they, they often do not like to wait. Um, so they'll show more negative affects during waiting, even when they're choosing to wait. Um, but that doesn't seem to actually be very predictive of their of their willingness to wait. So you'll see that they, they you know, for example, they'll scratch sometimes um, while waiting compared to not waiting. But that, it doesn't, they, they show this response, but it doesn't seem to affect their preferences. Um, let me ask you a question um, uh, as the questions are coming in. So you started out by contrasting your hypothesis about um, how or why cognition evolved, the ecological hypothesis with a social hypothesis. And um, you gave us some data for a one case study that support the ecological hypothesis. What sort of data motivate the social hypothesis? And um, how would the ecological hypothesis bear on those data? And can there be a rapprochement in some of these cases? I think you mentioned at some point that the social explanation may in some cases be some subsumed under the ecological explanation. Yeah, so you know, I, I, I think you know, a key thing I want to emphasize is that these aren't mutually exclusive hypotheses right. at all. I think sometimes they get set up that way, like either mm -hmm. the social hypothesis is right or the ecological hypothesis is right. And I don't think that that's 
true either in the sense. So first of all, I think probably it depends on the cognitive skill you're looking at. So I would be very surprised if some of these ecological variables predicted, for example, theory of mind like that. That would be very strange to me. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in the same way, the idea that social complexity would predict uh, spatial memory seems equally strange. So there's probably some domain specificity here in terms of which evolutionary process matters. Um, and there might be some evolutionary processes or some, some cognitive skills where both evolutionary processes matter. So I think um, the executive function data is the part where, you know, I think it is probably plausible that there is some relationship there because we see that uh, executive function do matter a lot for the expression of certain social cognitive abilities. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the older data on the social intelligence hypothesis is actually um, not data about cognition per se, but about brain size, um, using brain size as kind of a proxy for cognition. Um, and, you know, it's a lot easier to go out and measure lots of primates you know, whole brain size than it is to go out and measure lots of primates cognition. So, you know, that's why I think these more recent studies, you know, done by other folks that have looked at, you know, 13 primate species or 23 primate species and contrasted both hypotheses in the same data set are really crucial um, to sort out which cognitive skills matter. Um, and they've, you know, adapted these cognitive skills, uh, cognitive tasks can be used with a lot of species and, and compare them. And, I, and I'll say this is tough because the kinds of stuff you can do with a chimp is not the, the necessarily appropriate for a lemur and, and vice, ver mm -hmm. vice versa. So oftentimes if you have some cognitive task that's appropriate to capture variation in lemurs, you give this to apes and they're like, this is the easiest thing I've ever seen. Is this a joke? Um, and if you take the chimp task and you, have, you ask a lemur to do it, the lemurs, you know, are completely at floor, like they, they really cannot succeed. So there are these kind of taxonomic differences that make it pretty hard to directly compare a lot of species um, on the cognitive measures um, as opposed to the brain measures. But I will mention there's emerging evidence on even the brain measures that ecology seems to be really important for understanding brain evolution as well. So, you know, I think both are probably really important processes for understanding different different facets of cognitive, behavioral, and brain evolution. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Thank you. This brings us to the end of today's uh, MindCore seminar. Uh, we'll see everybody next week for the next talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, great thanks to Alex for being here today. And we'll see everybody next week. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you both. Next week we have Alison Gopnik, and so it'll be in the same place. And also this talk was recorded today and it will be available very, very soon um, at the same link where um, you watched it today if you'd like to share it with any of your colleagues. Um, it'll be available in about a minute after we end this broadcast. So thanks again. Thank you to both of you so much. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Bye.